So what I'm covering in my time with you today is essentially two elements around the human experience, our inner connection to self, our outer connection to one another. For me, there are five key elements that make up driving both of these things in our lives. And I'd like to share some experiences with you guys today on my own personal journey and professional journey relevant to me. And hopefully, again, you find some resonance for yourselves. I've been with Village Roadshow now since I was 18 years of age. I'm 53 now. I had a short break and did a few years with Wonderland Sydney when that park was active and then came back to the business in 2005. I've got a team of 130 across SeaWorld and Movie World that makes up singers, dancers, actors, technicians and a small leadership team of seven. And obviously we manage the day trade and then the major events through the year. We launched Fright Nights last week. We launched Spooky Nights at SeaWorld on Saturday and we're in rehearsals tonight. So our year is very busy. We're either in production or pre-production or post-production review on top of the day trade. The thing I love about that work more than anything that keeps me in it is the fact it's only about human connection. That whole business is built on connectivity with other people. It is the glue that keeps me in that role and it is the glue that keeps our team tightly knit. Before I get into those five elements, I just wanted to lay out some general observations I've found to be truth for me and maybe you'll find the same. This is a photograph of my father. Dad was quite a fascinating guy. He retired from the Royal Australian Air Force as a warrant officer disciplinary. As you can imagine, that title has with it a certain amount of gravitas. But that's not how his career began. He was abandoned by his father just before he was born, and then he was raised by his mother until she passed away suddenly at the age of 20. He was 20 and she'd passed. And he had to rethink, what am I going to do and where am I going to focus my attention? He joined the Air Force looking for a bit of a compass, looking for direction. It anchored him and it gave him a focus and it gave him a path. He entered the Air Force as a short order cook. And after a little while he thought, I think I can do more. So he applied himself and he became a fully qualified chef. But he thought he could do more. He decided he was going to become a senior ranking officer and run bases. And the idea of that in that era was unheard of. What ultimately happened was he became the very first person in the Royal Australian Air Force to work his way out of the kitchen and become a warrant officer over time. What I found with Dad's journey was observational inspiration in my own working life. And that's a burden or a privilege we all carry. Often we're setting a standard or we're sending a signal to other people that can be a signal of inspiration. I didn't realise how much of an inspiration he was to me until he was no longer in the world. And I took a big learning about that as well. Observational inspiration is happening on any given day of the week and we're all custodians of it. The words we say, the actions we exhibit, the choices we make are all signals to somebody else that have the power to heal and inspire, even if you're not aware that it's happening. Dad's life was a reminder of that for me. I also run a podcast, it's called Park Life. I've been doing that for a few years now. I sit with people inside my industry and I have a conversation with them. I've sat with chief operating officers and I've sat with frontline employees. There's about 40 hours worth of content there now across Apple, podcasts and Spotify. What I find by doing those stories is that there's a common thread that runs through all people, regardless of status, regardless of title or background, regardless of gender, there are these common themes that run through people. And these themes are for people that are finding success in their lives and satisfaction, resilience, passion, and understanding their why, why they do what they do, which we'll touch on. I talked a little bit a moment ago about observational inspiration. I want to give you some examples of that right here very quickly. You're going to hear the voice of a fellow whose name is Jimmy. Jimmy has just returned to Movie World as a performer after spending many years in Japan and Singapore as an actor in the Waterworld stunt show. In our industry, it's the highest regarded stunt show in the world. And his beginnings can be taken right back to the impact he had with the inspiration of a teacher that got through to him. She was a drama teacher. And he tells the story of how he was going to a class one day and she was delivering a monologue. 
and talking to the students about choice and truth. And he said that when she was done, he was moved to tears, as were most of the class. And he decided in that moment, I want to do whatever she just made me feel with my life. So here's a very short soundbite of him reflecting on that. Yes, why, like, why did I want to become an actor? You know, I remember the story. I remember the moment, the, the class, the teacher. I've thanked her since because she changed my life. A really simple statement. But he did something smart there too. He went and sought that lady out when he realised and could recognise that was the source of his inspiration that changed his life and was able to go back and thank her. Here's the great thing, of course. We're all here today, we're in the world, and we are all stories in progress. One of the things we often forget is that we're authoring our stories as we go. And often we can be spending time in the passenger seat rather than in the driver's seat, reacting to things rather than responding to things and charting a map to head to a destination. I came home one afternoon, I was relatively new into the job at Village Roadshow theme parks, I was pulling big days, sometimes 12 hours, and we were going through change management, so it was tumultuous. And I came home, had three kids, and my wife said to me, would you mind taking our daughter upstairs for a bath? So I, I grabbed her, I was still in my suit, and of course I'll do that, and I got my daughter upstairs and I had her in the bath, and I sat down by her side, I ran the water, I put her in, and with my right hand, I was splashing water and kind of bathing her as best I could as she sat there. And with my left hand, it might have been a Blackberry at the time, I was clearing email. Completely unconscious about what I was doing, but busy being busy because I was so important. And luckily, there's a little part of my brain that caught myself in that moment by being present in the moment. And it was the sound of her voice calling for me to pay attention and to look at her. And I snapped myself immediately out of that mode that I was in and took a good hard look at the man I was becoming. And I thought very quickly in that moment, if you stay on this path, you're going to miss all of this. So are you in the moment or are you busy being busy? That was a defining moment for me and I forever began to turn myself around. We're all perfectly imperfect. I'm far from perfect, but I can catch myself when I'm not in the moment and I'm missing what matters. And that's the trick, is to be able to catch ourselves when we're not quite where we need to be. And where we need to be is right where we need to be in the moment that we're in. This line came to me around that time in my life and I've used it since with some young leaders that come up around me. Who gets the best of us and who gets the rest of us? If you've got this turned up to 10 and that turned up to 10 all day long and it's just this giving of all of you in every moment with everybody because the job demands it, then the rest of you is left for the ones that love you the most who are sitting at home. And the stuff at the bottom of the emotional tank isn't really the good stuff, right? It's the worn out part of you. The mind's kind of worn out. The bottom of the emotional tank's worn out. So you go home and you give the people that matter the most that stuff and then they help you fill that back up through the night and remind you of your worth and remind you of your value. You thank them for that, you soldier on, you go back and you do it again. It's a great question to ask. And if you can answer it honestly, it can be liberating and an opportunity for change. This is a photograph of the human mind, as far as I'm concerned. It's a multi-lane freeway and there's traffic moving in all sorts of directions. I'm keenly aware, even though I'm standing here in front of you and speaking, I happen to be a vehicle that's right in front of you, so I'm getting some of your attention. But I can look and also understand that I'm not getting all of your attention. That would be a silly thing for me to believe possible. Because I already know the human mind is a traffic jam most of the time. So while you're looking and listening to me, you've got that thought that's coming up in the left lane that's been bothering you for the most of the afternoon. There's that speeding thought coming by in the right lane, hoping this finishes on time so you can get the hell out of here and stop listening to me. There's that thought that's four thoughts down about that thing you've got to do before you get to the weekend. And then there's me in front of you. We're a noisy animal, but that's also not who we're meant to be. I'll tell you something that absolutely changed my life some years ago was the realisation that we are not our thoughts. Stay with me. You're having thoughts. Your mind is generating thought traffic for you but you are not them. 
And if you were just living in a reactive state to thoughts generated by a mind you have no control over, what an exhausting way to live. And yet, most of us will spend a lifetime living like that. So if we're not our thoughts, what are we? Here's what we are. We exist in the space between competing thoughts. What's in the space between competing thoughts? Stillness, the moment. That's where we are. When we can tap into the present, there's more emotional energy, more mental clarity. You're more likely to say the right thing in the right moment because you're only in the moment rather than walking away and thinking days or weeks or years later, if only I'd said. We can take traffic control on our minds and slow it down on a daily basis quietly without anyone even seeing that we're doing it. And there are ways to slow the traffic down. And we'll talk about that as we move through. Anxiety is usually something that is caused by the tug of reflecting into the past while you're projecting into a future that you don't have and not being in the moment that you do have. So when we're doing that tug of war in our minds, anxiety is generated, doubt is generated. When we're in the moment, accepting it for what it is, for whatever it is, there's no room for anxiety about the future or the past. And when you think about it, it's kind of insane to be worrying about the thing that happened that time when, which is informing the presence you have in the moment you're in now, while you're worrying about that thing that's coming at a time when, maybe, perhaps, if. When we're doing that and living like that, there's only tension in the middle. Tension has a hard time getting in when we're just in the present, accepting it for what it is, irregardless of what it is, and taking our judgment away from it. I would argue if I was more present more often as a younger man, my first marriage would have stayed intact. But I wasn't paying attention because my head was in the future or I was celebrating wins of the past and lost up in the noise of my traffic in my mind. Once I realise that, I realise there's also another way to be. And it's liberating, rewarding, and life becomes much richer. Part of the trick here is to manage your attention rather than have your mind tell you this is the thing you'll focus on now and you'll think about and feel about. Take control of that. And as that thought appears, if it's not good for you, acknowledge it and let it pass. The mind will eventually take the coaching from you, bringing your attention to its workings, and it will comply. If some of what I'm saying sounds a little challenging, it's probably because it hasn't been a pattern of thought that you've brought to your daily lives. It certainly wasn't for me. I was hyper noisy in here for the longest time, hyper reactive to stuff out here. Managing our attention and the dosage of time we spend committed to a future we don't have or a past that no longer exists is the key. You can't deny it, but you can choose how much time you want to spend sitting in either of those states. Here's a great tool for getting into that space, active listening. Most of us are passively hearing most of the time, right? And that's fine. Passively hearing takes no energy. It buys us time. It doesn't change us, though. It doesn't allow anything new to come in because it's kind of lazy. Nothing wrong with it. Sometimes you have to move into passively hearing just to cope, right? But actively listening is when you allow yourself to change hardwiring in here with a new idea or a new thought to feel something for someone genuinely, to genuinely feel empathy, to genuinely say something that's helpful, rather than wait for that person to stop so you have your chance to speak, just to fill the air while you get to the next thing that's troubling you here. Active listening is a discipline that is a superpower that can transform personal and professional lives. I've seen it, and I've seen it happen in my own life. I was never good at it. I'm very good at it now, because I make an effort to be good at it. If I have a staff member that wants to see me about an issue, I make a decision to put myself in the present, turn my phone away, lock eyes with them, windows to the soul, and I actively listen to them. And sometimes I've got nothing to say. And I'll have someone say to me afterward, you're a great listener, thank you. And I think, well, I haven't actually said anything to you that's helped. But people know when they're being actively listened to. We feel it, we intuit it. It's a superpower if you can bring it into your personal and professional life. Very quickly, I run communication coaching with a business I call Stand and Deliver. I've been doing it for four years. I've worked with kids as young as 12, adults as old as 75. I've worked with corporates. This is a group of lawyers at a high-end law firm that I spent a session with. And I've worked with people from many different walks of life over four years. Here's the thing I find. 
Most of the time, most of us are in our own way, overthinking, letting that thought traffic take hold. Even people in these high-end positions react the same way when we run these sessions as people from a completely different field. There's these common threads in the human animal that just are what they are. So these things I speak of to you today are not only from my direct personal and professional experience, but also learned by being around people and working with them from a wide variety of backgrounds. And there are ways and means to transition beyond these patterns. Keep out of our own way. Stop overthinking. Stop feeding self-doubt in here. I'll tell my kids, you were born fearless. The human animal doesn't come into the world fear-filled. We learn fear. We learn self-doubt. We learn to hang on to that thing that was hurtful that was said to us all those years ago, and we ingest it. But we don't come into the world like that. I told my kids from a young age, you were born fearless. That's your birthright. You'll learn to be afraid. You'll learn to be doubtful. The trick is to make sure you choose what to absorb and you choose what you're just observing. You don't have to absorb all of the world because the world likes to remind you that you may not be all the things you think you are and you may not have the potential to be all the things you think you might be. Be the observer more often rather than the reactor. Observe the thought, observe the feeling connected to the thought, then choose a response equal to the situation that you're in rather than more intense than the situation requires. That comes by observing self and your inner workings more often. And you can do that on a daily basis. Observe the thought. What do I do with that? Choose a response rather than there's a thought, there's a reaction, there's a feeling. That's what a wild animal does because it's unaware of its own conscious existence. We have the advantage, but we often don't use that unique ability. On the left there, consciously choose to actively listen more often. I guarantee you, if you can make that a life habit, over the long term, you will transform personal relationships and professional relationships. I guarantee it, it's just a given. On the right, manage the mental dosage. Choose to make a decision of how much time you want to spend reflecting on what was and how much time you want to spend worrying about what might be that you don't yet have in front of you. Bring attention to that and manage it. Self-reflection expands self-awareness, simple as that. When we make time for ourselves to reflect, by default, it expands our sense of self-awareness. The more we understand our own unique inner workings, the much harder it is for anyone out here to hit our triggers. Much harder. Because you understand that internal terrain, rather than, why do I always act out like this? Why am I carrying around this regret from that thing that I said that day when I got hot? There's ways to avoid all of that. The more you understand how you uniquely work on your interior, again, it's a superpower. Connects you to yourself, keeps you grounded, keeps you anchored. That's just very quickly some shots of me. I was 18 when I became the youngest live show announcer in the history of SeaWorld. It was not easy. My very first public speaking experience was in a debating class. We were in a competition with this other class from another high school. Mum and Dad were both Air Force, and Dad was hoping I would join, but I was this artsy kid that couldn't quite fit in. And it confused them. I was off doing amateur theatre, amateur radio, and I really wanted that, and I couldn't quite figure that out. The closest I could get to arts in my high school was the debating class. I only ever did one competition, because it ended terribly. Now, you know how some memories are like looking through an opaque window? They're kind of faded, you know the memory is there, but you can't quite feel it or recall it. And other memories are in 4K. You can see it sharp, you can feel it in your bones when you play the memory back. It doesn't matter if it was 30 years ago, that memory, for better or for worse, is a high-def memory. This one's high-def for me. I'm in this class, three students on one side, three on the other, and all the parents seated much like you are, and I'm the last to speak for our team. And oddly enough, our subject was animals in captivity, for or against, we were against. It's kind of funny how things ended up the way they did. I was in grade eight. The two other kids with me were A-grade students. I still remember their names, Noel and David. A-grade. I was not. I didn't pay attention in class. I was drawing. If I wasn't drawing, I was thinking about something else. I was easily distracted. But I could do this stuff well, I thought. 
We had our palm cards. I can still remember on the palm card in the blue ink, the opening line was, let's be blunt. And I remember thinking, good opening line. Where's that going to go? Obviously, we got marked on our rhythm, our clarity, our tone, our prep. So I come out of the gates. These other two guys before me were sterling, and I'm closing argument. I get up, I start, and I come out of the gates pretty hot. I'm looking at my palm cards. I've got a rhythm. I'm looking up. I'm making eye contact. I know I'm getting points for that. But then I start to relax because I'm in the flow zone. So I look for my parents because I want them to be proud. So I'm looking for mum and dad. As I'm looking for mum and dad, they were easy to spot because the only two heads that were down in the palm of their hands were my parents, while I had the eyes of everybody else. And I went from hero to zero in what felt like nanoseconds. So the words on the card started to blur. I became a hot mess. I was sweating. I was so bad. I could see people squirming in their seats, uncomfortable for me, looking at each other, turning away. And the adjudicator had to come up and put his arm on my shoulder and say, thank you, Michael, that was wonderful. Let's get you to take a seat. And we lost, gloriously. It was made worse when the teacher followed me out to the car as I got in the back seat with mum and dad, stuck a head through the window and said, Michael, that was so good. Let's keep going and we'll work on it and we'll get you at the next one. And I already knew I was never going back. But I did know that I loved the idea of finding my voice somehow, some way, and owning it. So I worked harder on it. Resilience came into play unconsciously. While I never went back to debating, I did jump on a bus two weeks out of high school and found myself on the Gold Coast and put my hand up at SeaWorld, volunteered for many days, made myself known, and was eventually given a shot by someone very special, who I'll mention here toward the end. I tell my kids, resilience is a muscle that is trained in the gym of adversity, and we've all got free membership. No adversity, no growth. Adversity is a gift to grow us, even when it's painful, financial, physical, emotional. It has a gift on the other side of it. It will build resilience. It will generate wisdom. So when it comes to these things, choose attitude and perspective to challenges. What do I mean by that? Rather than reacting to the challenge, choose your attitude to it. Sounds easy? I know it's not. We all have a primal reaction first to any situation. That's hardwired into us. But we have the ability to transition from primal reaction into a higher response. And we often give that up unconsciously. Tapping into it is life-changing, particularly when you're dealing with conflict. Over to the right, judge less, accept more often. It took me a long time to learn this. I've worked with some pretty intense personalities, particularly in boardrooms over the last 30 years. One thing I've learned is everybody is operating from their own unique level of personal awareness. Some people may not have a high level of self-awareness going on, so they react out as they react out. When I can sense that in someone, I remove my judgment, I accept that that's the nature of that person's character, and I find a way to work with them if I'm forced to have to work with them. As soon as I take judgment out of it, there's no tension in there for me. It's liberating. For me, these things go hand in hand, self-discipline and self-love. This is my oldest son. He's much younger here. He's 18 now. He lives for football, completely different to his dad. Not interested in the arts, loves his football. This photo was taken around the time that he got a scholarship at Helen's Vales Primary School for his football. He had a team outside of the high school that he would meet with and play with on the weekends. When he got accepted on the scholarship at around this age, he took that news back to his team, his club team. And I was still in my suit, picking him up at the end of training one night. He jumped in the car, just a little guy, and he could see that he was inside himself and he was a bit upset. We we're talking, I said, how was training? He started to sniffle and he tried to be as manly as he thought he could be. And he was, it's fine, Dad. I said, no, no, how was it? it's fine. And then the nose started and, and he started to cry. I'm driving. There's no handbook for parenting rights. So I'm thinking, well, what's this? So I pull over to the side of the road rather than drive and talk. And I gave him my full attention and I actively listened to him. And he told me that he got to the training and he told all the kids his news. I got this scholarship. They accepted me because of my football. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, the kids laughed. And they were all saying, it doesn't mean anything. They give those things away. You're not special. It doesn't mean anything. It's a joke. 
They hand those things out. You're no one special. I looked at him, I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, listen to me. Those kids are your friends, so their opinion's important, right? He said, yeah, okay. Your coach has an opinion of you, that's important, right? He said, yeah. Your teachers will have an opinion of you, that'll be important, yeah? And I said to him, I'm your dad, so my opinion of you will be important. He said, yes. I said, okay. None of these are still the most important opinion. So who has the most important opinion about you? And I watched his eyes look up, thinking, and through his tears he looked at me and with a question mark said, me? I then said, stop. That's it. If you only remember one thing Dad ever told you, remember this. The most important opinion anyone will ever have about you is you. Are you proud of what you've achieved? I am. That's it. I also said to him, trust me, as you get older, buddy, this goes on forever. Not everybody wants to see you happy. Not everybody wants to see you succeed. You have to make sure you find the happiness inside here and you know what you're about because no one can touch that. When I was getting better at being present, I was able to do things like I'm going to show you here. It's only a couple of minutes. The first part of this clip is him days after that moment I've just told you about. The second part of this clip is six years later and I think you'll see a little bit of a transition of that little boy that didn't believe. All right, so here we are, it's Harrison's first day of high school. Just lean in, buddy, so we can see you. How are you feeling? All right. <laughs> Come in, lean in. A bit nervous? Yeah. Don't have to be, do you? Do you? No. So you got your scholarship? Yeah. Gonna do your footy? Gonna make new friends? Yeah. Come on, we can't see, you gotta lean in. Is that all good? Yeah. Okay, mate, so it's uh, been the last day of high school this week, you've graduated. Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, pretty good, eh? Oh, I feel so much better. It's um, good. Yeah, excited for the future. It's good. Well, are you excited about making new friends? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, making new friends out of high school? Yeah. Lean in, we can't see you. <laughs> yeah, leading new friends. Is anyone going to come up there? You the have middle? a good day? Yeah, it's going to be good. All right, mate. <laughs> All right. You crying? Maybe. <laughs> you crying? Yeah, maybe. A, a little, little bit? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. What Harrison began to understand was the power of choice and action. This is something given to us at the time of our birth, unlimited choice. I'm not suggesting that choices can't be limited. They can be limited by circumstance 100%. But we still have the power of choice to choose the attitude, to choose the thought to focus on. We shouldn't give that up. I love this image. One thing I've realised is life gives us alarm bells our entire existence if we're paying attention. And often we'll hit the snooze button, right? Because it's so comfy in this bed with that doona and I don't want to get up. I can tell you if I was paying attention through my first marriage, on reflection after it was gone, I could play it back like a movie and I could pinpoint the moments where the alarm was ringing and I could pinpoint the moments that I was just hitting snooze thinking, yeah, surely that'll figure itself out. Surely that's a problem she's got. Can't be me. Snooze, snooze, one year, two year, five years, gone, what? Try and pay attention, particularly when you're more present more often, to the alarm bells. Whatever they might be, professionally or personally, life will send you alarm bells before it often hits you hard, if we're paying attention. We can only pay attention if we're present, not if we're noisy. Conscious intention informs our actions. Rather than acting out or reacting out, conscious intention. What do I intend to do? How do I intend to do that? The outcomes then of our actions more likely to be in our favour. Rather than simply reacting, observing the emotion that's on us and regulating the emotion to serve us rather than having the emotion dominate us and tell us how it's going to be. We all feel the emotions. I'm not saying that there's not time to get angry or there's not time to get upset. There absolutely is time for that. I'm saying when we're in the 
position of being present more often, we can observe the emotion that's rising and regulate it rather than have it simply take hold of us, forcing us to act out. Being responsive and less reactive is a human superpower which will transform personal and professional relationships. Yes, there's moments to be reactive where we're driving and there's something happening, we've got to move quick. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be reacting when we need to. I am suggesting it is more powerful when you are responsive rather than reactive and you will grow from it and become a more fully realized human being. It's all about choosing response over reaction, choosing you. The difference between observation and absorption. We spend most of our lives defaulting to the state of absorption. I take it in, I absorb it. That thing you said, I absorb it. The way you behaved that time, I absorb all of that. It's exhausting. We have the power to move between observational state and a state of absorption. Not everything has to be all about taking it all in and owning it. Some of it can be, I'm observing this and I'm going to respond to it like that and retain the emotional tank and the mental fuel tank so that when I get home, I've got enough in that tank for me, enough in the tank for my loved ones because they deserve it too. Know that acts of self-discipline are also acts of self-love. They are one and the same. When we are more self-disciplined, we are also by default fueling self-love, not completely about ego or narcissism, genuine self-love, getting comfortable under the skin, getting comfortable with the person in the mirror, regardless of the world or what the world might tell you that you are or are not. Observe the primal reaction instinct. That's how we're built. We're hardwired for primal reaction instinct. When we know that, we can also know we're gifted to go to higher self-response, always more powerful. And it can be habitual the more you pay attention to it. Choose between what you observe and what you absorb. Forgive yourself. We're all perfectly imperfect. Stories in progress. Perfection doesn't exist in the human animal. It's not how we're built. But we are perfectly imperfect. So what's the point? I think the point is to evolve with every passing year of our existence. Can I look back as the years go on and say I'm a better version of the person I was then? Or do I honestly look back and go, wow, me at 53 is a lot like me at 20. What's up with that? I say that people should check in on themselves their entire lives with this question that's only one word. If you don't know why you're doing something, what are you doing? It's easy if someone asks you, what is it you do? That's an easy question to answer. It's a harder question to answer when they ask why you do it. And I say that if you can't say it in a statement, then you don't know why you do it. I'll give you an example in my own life here. This email comes through from a guest. Guest services, entertainment review, please read. I open it. It's long. If this is a negative, I've got to spend at least an hour responding to this and following it up. I'm going to tell you about that email that I read because it changed my professional life forever. It was over 10 years ago and it answered for me why. And I didn't know that I had a question to ask myself until I read it. The email began with a lady beautifully writing about how she spent a year saving for the holiday to come to the Gold Coast from Sydney with her family. She beautifully described having a healthy young boy and a terminally ill daughter. And she went on to describe how this was going to be our last holiday as a family. So we wanted it to be very special. By now, I'm reading it thinking, please, I hope it was a good time. She writes in beautiful detail of how she waited at the main gate, first in line. They got through excitedly. She carries her daughter because of her daughter's condition. And she writes about how her daughter is constantly in a pain state because of her condition. So she's always in some form of physical discomfort. So she writes about how they get to the top of Main Street at Movie World, and if you know it, you look down on the right-hand side on the corner, there's a photo store. And she sees there Sylvester, Bugs, and Tweety from the Looney Tunes. And she says to her husband, great, we're the first ones, let's go and get a photo. So she talked about how they raced down to be the first ones there. As they got there, she writes about how whoever was inside Sylvester that day was amazing. He gestured to us with cradling arms and asked me to come over. I thought twice about it because of how sick my daughter is, but I thought, why not? 
So I handed my daughter over to Sylvester and he cradled her. And my husband stood back to get the photo. As he went to get the photo, my daughter's body went limp and her head fell back and her eyes focused on Sylvester and she pulled back this beautiful smile and we've got it forever, long after we no longer have her. And I just wanted to say thank you. I swear to you that was like a eureka moment for me. I straight away jumped on the roster. I found out who played Sylvester that day. I always say his name, Chris Girin, young actor. I found on the roster he was working that day. I printed it off the printer. This line came into my head. Ah, we hardwire memories for people's lives. That's my why. Why do you do this? Because we get to hardwire memories for people's lives. That's a good job. If I know what my why is, I can do the what. Why is a great question to challenge ourselves with, because if we know why, we'll find the fuel to do the what. It's harder to find the fuel to do the what if you don't know why you're doing it. This is the last photo I have of me and my dad. Just a couple of hours after his birthday, he passed away, he took a fall, and he was hospitalised. And he passed away suddenly in the early hours of the following day. I was with him. And it was a really tough thing because he was less a father and more a brother. We never had a father-son relationship. We ended up having like a brother relationship. So losing him was, was really tough. And it happened at a time where I was working on a theme park in China. Village Roadshow was partnering with an American company building a theme park in Zhuhai, a province of China, and they were sending us over months at a time. So I had lost dad in March, and then I turned 50 the following June of that same year. And I turned 50 on a day where I was sitting in an airport in this province of China. I didn't speak the language at all. The translator I had assigned to me had gone, and I was waiting to catch a flight that had been delayed by four hours to get to Shanghai to speak by invitation at a theme park industry event. And I was in the downest of downs, still grieving him, then hitting the milestone of 50, grieving that, sitting in an airport away from family, wondering how the hell that happened. And I shifted my thinking when I got to my hotel hours later in Shanghai. I got in on my own, the room is beautiful, it's high end, they looked after me. The next day I'm speaking at this conference by invitation, there's people there from Universal, from Disney, what a great opportunity. Dr. Wayne Dyer, if you haven't read his works, I highly recommend seeking him out. He had a great line, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. I changed the way I looked at things and I started to reprogram this. Rather than just say these things, I started to act on those things and I re-hardwired my thinking. So I moved into gratitude rather than grief. I transitioned from the grief into gratitude. You had 50 years with that guy. 50 years and you had nothing in the tank unsaid. You said everything to each other. Not everyone can say that. You can. Then I thought to myself, you got to sit with him and hold his hand as he left the world and comfort him. How many people get that gift? You've got that. You got invited to speak in another country and do a keynote for industry and be put up in a hotel, all expenses paid. Gratitude. You got to turn 50. Some people didn't get there. You got to get there and you're going home to a family that's waiting for you. Gratitude. And I did. I started to rehardwire my thinking. On that trip, I stopped drinking. I stopped eating poorly. I started walking every day. For the last three years, I'm a dawn riser. These are just some photos I'm sharing with you that I annoy people on my Instagram with because I see sunrise six days a week. I did 15 Ks this morning at 4.30, not at a pace. I just cruise. I watch the sun come up, do two and a half to three hours. I'm in bed early, I'm up early, every day. I'm not saying everyone should do that. That's just what I started doing. And I reset this every day, every day. My hard drive's got more room on it on any given day because I'm not going to bed congested here, waking up congested there, and just loading data, loading data, loading data. I clear and defrag 
every day. And I see the dawn and get to appreciate how small I am and how temporary my life ultimately is. And there's not enough time for carrying the weight of negative thought or angst. But we have to take responsibility and we have to take action. I went to visit a family member who was alone in a home, very ill. I met my mother there, we we're on our way to her room. Her room was to the right of where that image was shot. As we're walking into that room, I just caught that picture. You don't need me to tell you a thing about that image. It tells you everything. Me, three years ago, I wouldn't have looked at the lady sitting on her own by an empty chair, knitting in a home and thought about her. But I thought about her and I caught that photo as I walked in and sat with my auntie Shirley in her final days. And I realised I'm not even thinking now about being present. I'm more and more just present. And that image became provoking for me, made me think a little richer and deeper about my own journey and what I'm doing with the time I'm given. When I was 18, trying to become a show announcer at SeaWorld, no one would give me a break. This guy gave me one. His name was Chuck Gard, a big Canadian guy. Big, larger-than-life personality. He was the main show announcer at SeaWorld from 1975 right through. He took a chance on me. That's the short version of that story. A lot of people wouldn't because I was just a kid. He gave me a shot. I auditioned for him in an empty stadium at SeaWorld one day with a microphone and a full ski show behind me because I pestered him to let me try. And with an audience of one, he sat there, very stoic, and when we finished, he called me up, put his arm around me and said, well, all right, welcome to the team. That decision changed my life. I hadn't seen him for 20 years. This is from last week. I rang him. I said, hey, it's me. Said, oh, hey, Mikey, how are you? Said, I'm good. Would you come over to Movie World? Let me buy you a coffee. He said, oh, man, I'm not going back there. I'm an old man. I'm not going back. I said, oh, come on, let me, let me buy you a coffee. He came in. We sat. He's a very stoic kind of guy. He doesn't go below the surface. So I wrote him a letter. I bought him a coffee. We talked and laughed. As we're leaving, I gave him a letter. He couldn't get away quick enough from me. So I've got a letter here for you. He never had kids, never had time. As he's walking out of movie world, I said, I want to give you this letter. He said, oh, that's okay. I said, no, 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 let me, let me give you the letter. Read it in the car. Okay, thank you. And he said, I'm proud of you. You took it further than I thought anyone could. And I said to him, I did it on your shoulders. I only did it because you gave me a lift. I want to make sure that you hear that from me. Okay, thank you, Mike. In that letter, just one simple page, I thanked him. And I said, you took a gamble on an 18-year-old kid and a lot of who I am in this business is built on who you were. And I just want you to know that I'm thanking you for that. He sent me a text later in the day and it just said, thank you, Michael. <laughs> I call it closing circles. Sitting with Chuck the other day, it hit me. I should be closing some more circles here. Regardless of how that person reacts or responds, I want to close that circle off because I'm present now more than any other time in my life to understand gratitude is the way to real happiness. And you'll find on reflection, you will have more to be grateful for than you possibly are aware of right now if you make it a daily habit. Stronger connection with others is shaped through your interest in them. You can't expect bonds to tighten if there's no interest in tightening the bond. Tightening the bonds comes from interest, active interest. We're all stories. And at some point in time ahead, all it is that we leave behind are the stories. I often think about when I'm not here, what will be the stories that my children tell? What will the story be? Because you're writing it now. You're writing it every day in the words you use, in the behaviour you exhibit. You're writing the story of your life for those people in your life, here in your work, on a daily basis. So remember, make presence a practice. Form habits of self-care and self-love. React less, respond more. And lastly, your why is your anchor. Find the why. That's the thing that sits in the earth inside. The why will keep you anchored. Thank you for being so attentive, and I hope some of this is relevant to you. Cheers, guys. Thank you.